As the expiration date for the signing of the Electoral Act Amendment Bill passes, lawmakers gear up to override President Fahari and pass the document into law. And the People's Democratic Party PDP out the ruling APC, which is the All Progressive Congress, asking them to explain its connections with the killings in the country. Well, this is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anacom. The House of Representatives might override President Muhammad Buhari on the yet-to-be-assented electoral amendment bill. Now, this is because the constitutional 30 days window given to the president uh, to give or withhold his assent to the bill has elapsed. Now, Sunday, December 19, 2021, was the deadline, marking the exact 30 days the bill was transmitted to the president to sign into law. As at now, there is no communication from the president to the House on whether he will be giving or withholding his assent. Recall that two major contentious clauses in the bill were the electronic transmission of election results and the direct mode of primaries for political parties. Now, the presidential spokesperson, uh, Garbashi, who had spoken on this particular issue, saying that the president is not legally bound to publicly declare his decision on the amendment bill. Well, joining us to discuss this and break it down is John Gall Labour. He's a former speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly and Jide Olobu, who is a legal practitioner. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Good evening. Thank you very much. Good Thank evening. You. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. I, I'm, I'm going to start with you, Jide, um, as a lawyer before I go to John to give us some of the uh, models of Randy in the uh, in, on the floor of the National Assembly. But... Um, the 30 days has elapsed. Every single person is wondering what's next because the president hasn't spoken officially. Um, Garba Shehu is saying that the president does not necessarily have to give his assent publicly. In other words, he might do it um, privately. But every single person is wondering what should be next. Legally, from a legal perspective, what should be the next um, you know, action that should be taken? Okay, let's lay a foundation. There are about eight steps in making a law. You talk about the introduction of the bill. Then you talk about the first reading, second reading, reference to the committee, then the report stage and the third reading of the bill and signing of a copy of the bill by the National Assembly that will be forwarded to the president for his assent and Section 4 of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended gives the National Assembly at the federal level the power to make laws for the peace, order, and good government of Nigeria. And the president is expected to sign the bill into law within 30 days. And if he refuses to sign it, we call it veto, which means that he has refused to sign. And it, it will either come with comment that, okay, go and review these clauses in the bill. And we have not received any reports to that effect now. And what happens in that situation is that that bill is returned for reconsideration to the National Assembly that may reconsider it, look at the comments of the president, and streamline it to meet his expectations, then returns to him for final enactment, signing, assent of the president. And in a situation where the president does not pass any comment and does not sign the bill into law, then the National Assembly has the veto power also to, you know, by two thirds of the majority in the House, pass it into law if they come to the conclusion that the president is trying to use discretionary power unnecessarily. Don't forget, like I said earlier, the purpose of the National Assembly is to make law for the peace, order, and good government of Nigeria. And the stage we are now, it's not clear why the president 
has not assented to the bill forwarded to him. For the National Assembly has the power to veto that decision. Okay. And the big question now is that will they exercise that power? Let me we understand the relationship between the executive arm and the legislative arm of government, particularly when it appears that the Senate president will want to flow in the line of the president. Well, let me go to um, John to explain more to us. Um, a lot of people have wondered why there's been so much silence over 20 hours. People are still waiting to hear from the president and nothing's coming from the president. And just like Jide has said, he, if, he depends on what the president de decides to do, if he's going to make comments or not. But now the other million dollar question is, will the National Assembly have the guts to sign this or pass this uh, bill into law? Being that, a lot of things are riding on it, including the 2023 elections. Yes, um, I think that um, now you have to distinguish between uh, politics and law. Um, the law is there, now you have to go to politics. The legislature is an arm of government. The executive is one arm, the judiciary is one arm. There's a relationship management strategy that holds all this arm together. The Senate president, you know, and the Speaker of the House of Reps, being a bicameral legislator, you know, are both um, members of the of the ruling party, the APC. And you will realize that before now they had an engagement with the president to urge him to sign the bill. Now the president has not signed. Naturally, the president will transmit his report back to the House to say, um, I'm unable to sign this, I'm not unable to sign it. Give his reason so that the legislature can look at it and call the bill back. The other option is to override the president. I think it will be difficult to override the president. They have the powers to override him, but the political relationship that has existed between the Senate and the House of Reps, represented by their speaker and the president of the Senate, I don't think they will override the president. What I rather see happening is that there will be some kind of information transmitted, maybe unofficially from the president to both the speaker, the president of the Senate. What I have seen, what my analysis is that the president is okay with the electronic transmission of results. If that bill is forwarded as a separate bill, he may sign it. Uh, the president is not okay with the issue of uh, imposing a particular format of conducting primaries on all political parties, insisting that all must be by direct primaries. I think the argument, what the Senate may do in the circumstance, is for them to include in the clause, uh, provide the options of direct or indirect primaries, and leave it to the political parties. If that happens, that will be in line with Schedule 5 of the Constitution. I think the president can sign at that point. Uh, but for now, uh, my experience of the legislature, the ruling party will not want to confront the president. This is not the first time this is happening. Remember that in 2000, uh, part of the time as the president, overrided Obasanjo on, on the NDC Act. What you have as the NDC Act was rejected by Obasanjo with reasons. He reduced the 13 percent and said it will be 3 percent, and from the 3 percent, the communities will donate. NDC uh, communities will donate. Uh, will only be giving 1.3, and they overrided the president in that regard. Now, that kind of situation may not arise at this time. So what I see happening is that there's going to be some kind of understanding between uh, both houses of, uh, of uh, both houses of, of the legislature and the National Assembly, and then there's going to be some transmission of information by either to the Attorney General or the essay to the President of the Legislature. Uh, my experience of being in the legislature shows that there's already a lot of information that is going around uh, between yes, but, the, but, but uh, if, if I understand what you're saying, you're saying that this all will be judged on the scale of or on the basis of politics and not necessarily the people here. Um, you're saying that because of who the, 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 the speaker and the deputy speaker is or who the pre Senate president and the deputy Senate president is, it might be difficult. But where does the interest of us Nigerians come in? Because if you have said, you, you, you gave us an instance of overriding uh, in 2000, when you know the Senate had overrided, um, overrid Mr. President, um, you know, uh, on the basis of um, the NDDC um, Act. But I'm asking, we the people are okay with the things that are in, um, you know, the Electoral Act bill that is being amended right now. And if Mr. President is not okay with what is in it, and this is what the National Assembly agrees with, and this is what the people agree with, this is what INEC has okayed 
What's stopping the National Assembly? Why should politics be prioritized over the interest of the people? This is where I'm going with all of this gibberish. Well, that's what, that's what I'm saying, that first of all, you are, when you get into the legislation, you must understand the relationship between law and politics. It's not every member of the National Assembly that is a lawyer. The National Assembly is made up of more of lawyers and people who are nominated as representative of their party. In the National Assembly, there is a caucus of, the, of each of the political parties. You have the APC caucus and the PDP caucus, represented by the leader of the House and the, and the minority leader of the House. That's majority and minority leader. A lot of politics will go on. The PDP, uh, the governor's from first of all, which is not a part of this of the legislature, already is opposed to that bill. The attorney general, from what we've seen, is also opposed to it. There's going to be a lot of pressure. Most of the National Assembly members may listen to their governors. Most of the senators may listen to their governors. Some of them may listen to their political parties. The governors are going to move in and begin to lobby their members of the National Assembly, their senators and members of the House of Reps. As a member of the PDP, I can tell you that we are not opposed to direct primaries, but we are opposed to the fact that the National Assembly by the Electoral are going to impose on the political party. We need to have an option, whether it is direct or indirect. Our constitution is very clear on the mode of our primary. So by the time you insist that we must do direct primaries, we either have to pull the convention and amend our part, our constitution to insist on that, or we have to go down and begin to prepare. And either way, politically, there's going to be a lot of lobbying that will happen. The National Assembly will not just immediately convene tomorrow. May not, they may not have the number of the quorum. A lot of members are out on Christmas activities and all of that. So what we should watch out for is the what is going to go behind in the relationship circle between the both the, the caucus of the various of the of the APC and the PDP, the minority and the uh, uh, other caucus. And then also look at the interest of the governor and the interest of uh, the executive in this situation. I doubt whether this national assembly that has been a yes national assembly, people have called them a rubber stamp national assembly will veto the president. We will override the president's veto. I doubt if that will happen. Uh, the issues are complex. They will still want to work with the president. And I think that the issues in the law, you can streamline them into two. With respect to the direct transmission of votes, remember that the National Assembly had voted against it. Eventually, they, they came back, did a U-turn, and voted for it. So that is not an issue. Okay. Maybe one of the strategies I see coming out is that they may stain the issue of the electronic transmission. So as a single bill, the president will sign it. The second aspect, which is the controversy now, is the issue of direct primary. And the, for what I've seen from Governor's Forum and some PDP members, what they want is for the law to have the option of direct and indirect, provided for the political parties. Let it be the national convention of the parties that will not choose the mode of the primaries. Don't insist by law that all of us must do direct primaries. That is where the issue is. OK. Back to you, um, um, Barsa Ulogo. Where is the sense of urgency in all of this? Because everybody's also, um, like John Gold just said, that you might not have a quorum if you decide that you know to reconvene the National Assembly now. Most people are on holiday. And like I said earlier on at the beginning, there's a lot that is riding on this. He's made a case for you know certain political parties not being okay with the imposition of direct primaries, even though a lot of people have pointed to it as something that would help to... Um, make our democracy somewhat robust. It would be free, fair, and credible. Uh, but we do not know this is subject to debate. But again, um, as he has said, this seems to be something that might not, it might not be conclusive uh, anytime soon. It looks like it's going to dra drag through 2022 with all of the, according to him, lobbying and the back and forth as to the controversies within the act. You know, all these they have been presented to the president. When you talk about 30 days, you are not talking about, you are talking about 30 calendar days within which all the lobbying that have been carried out. I read a report that the Attorney General of the Federation, who is a legal officer, has advised the president, even on the issue of direct primaries, and his own position as a legal advisor to the president is that the direct primaries may create fresh issues. For example, are we now saying that all the parties already have their constitution? We have to go and amend their constitution since they've had the option of either direct or indirect primaries under the Electoral Act of 2010. 
You see, then, considering the cost also, as we speak right now, INEC has, you know, come out to say that they require about 305 billion naira to conduct 2023 elections. And recall that the 2019 election <coughs> cost the nation about 189 <coughs> billion naira. So when you look at all this, if this matter is very serious, and if democracy is a serious issue for the National Assembly, Assembly and the presidency, the 30 days are long enough to fine tune everything and pass this bill into law. And if there are issues the parties need to go and manage, let them go and manage it at their own level. I mean, when some argue that the direct primaries will cost more money than necessary, I want to ask a simple question right now, <clears throat> deviating from what we are discussing to the light environment in a lighter mood. How did Big Brother Niger, how did they conduct the elections that led to the winner of that contest? You see, we are in the era of technology. But the processes are totally different. Barista Logo, the processes that are, you know, are undertaken are totally different. You can just send a text on your phone and it's recorded as a vote. But that's not the same thing when it comes to casting your vote why, in a general it election. Not the same thing? If, if, if not, the then, we, of, if we I mean, the that system can be easily rigged. I could send 30 messages and have 30 there votes. No that's that totally different. Rigged. We have discussed it. Even the direct primaries, if you ask all card carriers to come and vote expressly, they can be bribed. They can be intimidated. They can be manipulated. So if we decide, as Section 15, Subsection 5 of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 has amended says, that the state shall abolish corruption and abuse of power. If we decide to deal with corruption, we have processes that are less costly than what we spend now. And that is the position small courts have taken. For example... I totally agree with you, but I'm saying that we cannot compare the voting system that, is it Deloitte or one of those people, use in gathering votes for Big Brother. We why, cannot why, compare why it to how INEC let, let, gathers let votes a for a, a general let election and anywhere else in the world. Let me, let, me ask, let me add this question, Matt. Now, let's assume, and we don't pray for it, that another wave of serious COVID-19, something more serious than Omicron, comes when the parties are to have their primaries. And the only option open is for them to have these primaries, direct primaries, by technology. We they not have it. I mean, let's, 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 let's look at all this. You ask a question. Where is the interest of the people? So 305 billion naira to conduct 2023 election. That is what the INEC is asking for now. And you and I know that what they will get from the government will be more than this. For how long do we continue on borrowed money? So why can't we simplify processes and let parties go and sort themselves out? Roll out this law, and even if your position is that you want to leave the clause in the bill that has been the, the Electoral Act of 2010, that gives the parties the option of direct primaries and indirect primaries, then go ahead and do that. If what is disturbing you is the electronic transfer of results, then send your comment to the National Assembly. And INEC came out to say they do not have any problem with electronic transfer of results. Because you recall that, that when, when that issue came up, it was thrown onto debate. They wanted NCC to be the one to to agree with uh, INEC whether to deploy uh, technology or not. No, let us develop our institution. Let's, let's have a system that can be trusted. You see, the whole essence of coming up with electoral laws is so that we can have free, fair, and credible election, not just by local uh, evaluation, but by global evaluation. We need to rise up and, you know, like the former president of the USA, Thomas Jefferson said, we do not have government by the majority. We have government by the majority who participate. So you need to allow people to participate. Enough of these manipulations and the big wigs have it all. And on the side of the governors, you can understand their sentiments. If the president evaluates it also, some of the reasons why the governors are not comfortable with the direct primaries it's because under the indirect primaries, 
Delegates will go and represent the members of the party. And you know what can happen. Delegates can be easily said to, and whatever decision they take is binding on the party members. Okay. And direct primaries is saying, all of you can now come. You know, come and choose who we go and represent you. And we all know that those we choose at the primary level, we go and represent us. So whether they get there to represent us or not, let the people even have the input. Perhaps if they have the input, they will have the opportunity of choosing the candidate they are persuaded will represent them, rather than some money bags in the party just coming out to say, no, this is the party I had, the, the candidate I have endorsed. And okay. the delegates we endorse also, and we have we have we, we then go ahead to fill them at the general elections. And then I one other president, former president of the US, Abraham Lincoln, a respected figure in democracy, said that the ballot is stronger than the bullet. So okay. if indeed we are going to begin to diminish the banditry and the criminality associated with elections in the country that we should come up with laws that will sanitize the processes. Okay. And that is my position. Okay. And now that the president has not assented to the bill, and I have not read of any reason for not doing that, as required by the, by the laws of the land, then let's see, like, my, like uh, my colleague in the analysis mentioned earlier, do you trust this ninth assembly to be able to confront the president and veto this bill into law? And these are questions. So at the end of the day, who are they really representing? Their, their interests or the interests of the people? And permit me to echo that the purpose of having the legislature is for the peace, order, and good government of the nation by virtue of laws that come out of that uh, that arm of government. So okay. we, are, we, right. are, we are watching and waiting to see the outcome of this impasse. Um, John Gall, CSOs have told the president that he is the biggest, um, you know, threat to um, democracy in the country. And all this, all of this is because uh, of the delay and the um, misread body language uh, coming from the Mr. President. And of course, uh, the response uh, by his personal aide saying that uh, he is communicating um, privately um, with members of the National Assembly on this issue. But I do, CSOs seem not to be okay with this. But then the other issue that I wanted to bring up was uh, what Barrister Logan pointed out as to political parties having to deal with the issue of direct primaries, suck it up, I think, in a way, um, and, and do the needful. Uh, he also talked about the issue of um, you know, the financing. I think INEC recently came out to say that um, political parties are going to bear the monetary burden of conducting the direct primaries because the first issue, the first concern was that people were wondering if the government had to pay um, or INEC had to fund all of the, those direct primaries depending on how they were staggered. But now they have come out to say that political parties are going to be the ones who would shoulder that if it becomes law. Um, but again, I want to know why the PDP is mostly against it. Is it about the finances or is it about the modus operandi? Mr. Labo, can you hear me? Mr. Lebo, can you hear me? Yes, okay, it's a question for me. No, 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 it's for John Gall. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we have him, but okay, I'm going to come back to you, um, Barista Logo, because I think we lost um, that connection with John Gall. Um, so, but, but INEC has come out to say that these monies, you heard the question I was asking him, that this monies uh, or the funding of these direct primaries are going to be mostly done um, by political parties, meaning that it's going to have to cost them a lot more. And don't forget that Nigerians also have concerns about how expensive, you know, these tickets are for running for these offices in the first instance. So that might also mean um, increasing the amount of monies. And, and there's a cap also as to how much political parties are to spend, even though most of these political parties have de refused to declare, you know, how much they spend per election. So these are all of the issues that we might be having to reanalyze before Mr. President finally pe puts pen to paper. So going forward. You know, co commendably, INEC came out to tell the world that the issue of direct primaries is the concern of the parties. And I quite agree with that. So if they are cost effective in their parties, 
they will minimize the expenditure and mobilize funds to have effective primaries to nominate candidates that will come and represent them. So leave that to the parties. Then let INEC be concerned about the management of the general elections, even though INEC also will carry out oversight functions during the primaries. Let it be the, the headache of, of the parties to facilitate that. You know, let's let's give consideration to how this country develops. And I can let you know that globally, the best practice is to minimize costs from year to year. And that is why you come up with innovation. That is why you come up with different kinds of inventions to ensure the life is simpler. And again, that you have what we call inclusiveness, that people are included. And it's a core kernel in the tenets of democracy. Mm. It has to be participatory, you see. And that's what we give people the sense of belonging. And that is what also we give politicians the mindset that, hey, these people are interested in what I'm going to do there. They have all come together to nominate me, not just a few influential ones that gather together and I found my way. So they can also recall. And, and again, I want to say, even all these laws we have, do we implement them? We just mentioned the, the case now that the National Assembly has the power to veto the president. But 30 days are gone now. What are we going to see? Even though it is, it's been disclosed that the House of Reps may be trying to override the president. But you know that we have a bicameral legislature. We have the, and the House of Senate made up of 109 senators. We have the House of Reps made up of 360 health representatives made up of a bouquet of different parties. And the dominant party will be the one to rise up. Recently, you saw what happened to the bill of Ulujimi in the House, the bill on gender uh, gender equality. How some rose up and said, no, it's against uh, culture and religion and stuff like that. So we are asking for the prominence of the interests of the people. This country needs security. This country needs good welfare. This country needs prosperity. What can we do to get to that, uh, to that state? And the electoral process is critical in all this. Okay. Electronic transmission will reduce talkery and snatching of ballot boxes. You see, okay. pegging the expenditure of the parties will reduce the influence of money bags. Okay. You, know, okay. you know, and by the time we finally graduate to e-voting, then we can sit in the comfort of our homes and not need to be printing ballot papers and stuff like that. Four of us belong to professional bodies that we carry out e-voting. We have very to wonderful, seamless, no. No gra gra, no shaking, you know. So okay, that's what we're we asking go. for. Let's let's move up. Let's move up as a nation. So we wish the president and the national assembly the wisdom to cross the bridge where we are now, because the world right. is also monitoring us to see how effective our consumer provisions are. All right. And so and we should not in any way give the impression that we can overrun the rule of law. All right, Vice Judo Logun is a legal practitioner. We also want to say thank you to John Gall Labour. He's a former speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly. Unfortunately, we lost him, uh, the connection to him while we were having this conversation. Thank you so much for being here, Barrister Logun. Thank you. God all bless right. Nigeria. Well, thank you all for staying with us. Coming up on Plus Politics, the PDP accuses the APC of failing to curb insecurity in the country. We'll talk about it after this break.